What do you say, church? You know, it always amazes me how God lines up the special music to fit with the message He's laid on my heart. And the children's story and all the rest of the service. It's amazing how God, without even communicating, laid that song in your heart, Elena. Praise God. What do you say, church? Beautiful. Thank you for letting Christ sing through you. Very much appreciated. I love the children's story. I loved having our young people up here. Lewing the scripture and uh, calling for the offering. What a blessing to see our young people already at the small age becoming leaders for Jesus Christ. It's what we're here for, to hasten the second coming of Christ. And while we wait to raise the next generation of faithful followers for Christ. Praise God you all are here. It's so good to see each one of you. I don't know, it was so nice to wake up and see the sun shining this morning after weeks, months, years of no sun. You all just look a lot happier today. I don't know why, but I think it's the sun that was shining while we drove here. God's good. Well, as we begin, forgive me, I'm going to move this just a little bit over to the side because I appreciate being able to speak directly to each one of you there. Happy Sabbath. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we gather here to worship, we've already been touched by the worship service thus far. But now you are calling us again to dive into your word. As we've been meditating on stories from the book of Exodus and the book of Genesis over the last number of weeks, Again, we're going to be looking at another story. Father, these are your stories. This is your word, and and I pray that this will be your message. And for that to happen, I need to disappear, and Jesus needs to be lifted up. So, Father, we humble ourselves here, asking that Jesus will come and fill this room, that he will be the one that speaks to each person here. May each one feel that individually Jesus is speaking a sermon to their heart. And may that include me so that we all leave having been challenged, transformed, inspired, and carried forward by the grace of Jesus Christ. But we ask this all in His wonderful name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 3. I was driving on my way back home from Wichita State University where I was going to university or to school. I just finished my chemistry class, the class had gone really well, and I had, um, was driving on my way back, and as I was driving, I took a right on a street. You know how sometimes you have to zigzag to get where you want to go? You start down, then you cross over, and then you start down again. And I was driving back towards the house, and I needed to move over, and as I zigzagged down a street, I saw my, I noticed my car was slowing down. Of course, I was the one slowing it down. And I realized that I was passing a store that many times before I had stopped and bought something and bought items in that should not have come into my home. And I knew that today I had a choice to make. You see, some months prior to this, well, actually it wasn't a couple months, it was about a month earlier, maybe three weeks, about two o'clock in the morning, I had gone out into the field on our property and thrown myself down before God and had given my heart to Jesus Christ in the middle of an agonizing week where I'd finally realized that Phil trying to make his way work was not working, that he needed Jesus Christ to take control of his life. The week prior to that, that a giving of my heart to God, a lot of things had finally come piling on and I realized that I couldn't do it on my own like I had been. I needed to finally let Jesus take control of my life. And so out in that field, three weeks prior to the event that I'm telling you about, I had knelt down and I had finally said, God, take control of my life. I am completely yours. Praise God that he took my life. 
And I got up off my knees, and I was pretty excited. I had finally given myself to Jesus Christ, and, and I kind of figured that everything would go really smoothly. I had, I had areas in my life that I had fallen down in pretty hard, but I believed, now I'd given my life to Jesus Christ, I believed in an omnipotent God. Do you believe in an omnipotent God this morning? That when you give yourself to him, he can transform you, yes or no? Praise God, we have a God who can and does transform his children. But I kind of misunderstood how the transformation would take place. I figured that once I gave my heart to Christ, it just kind of, he would, God, you know, I'd have some challenges here and there, but God would take care of the really ucky stuff I wanted gone. Are you with me? And now I'm driving home, and I'm passing the store. Now, I know all of you are wondering what it is I wanted to buy there. So I'll tell you. Um, this may seem really small to you, but there's something about the Christian life. Your struggle is not my struggle, and my struggle is not your struggle. What to me seems easy and a no-brainer, to you may seem impossible to gain the victory. And to you, what seems so easy that you should be able to walk away with nothing, to me may seem impossible without the power of Jesus Christ. We all have a different journey. We all have the same destination, Jesus Christ. We all have the only way to get there is through Christ, so don't misunderstand me. But the struggles we have on the way to Christ are unique to each and every one of us in this room. So as I was on my way there, my personal struggle was media. I was addicted to movies, specifically sci-fi shows. I loved them. I could spend hours and hours on them when I should have been spending time with Christ. It took the place of my devotions. It was taking the place of everything. And when I'd come to Christ and thrown myself down, that was the thing that I figured God was going to rip away from my life, and I was no longer going to have any desire to go and buy because back then streaming didn't really exist, go and buy DVDs anymore. And as I'm driving by the Barnes and Nobles that I had often stopped at, the car began to slow down and all of a sudden I realized the temptation was coming on in incredible strength. I pulled into the parking lot and I remember while I'm pulling in, I'm saying, God, why haven't you removed these desires? Why haven't you taken away this craving that I have for this? I've asked you to give me victory. Why am I in this parking lot? And it was, you know, the Holy Spirit said, well, you turned in. Um, but you understand the struggle I'm facing, right? I pulled into the parking lot. And then I stuck the car in reverse and I pulled out of the, uh, the parking spot I'd gone into and I drove around the parking lot and I drove past the entrance and I come around and I pull into another spot and then I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to. So and, and all the time I'm saying, God, why am I struggling with this? I thought I was free. Exodus chapter 3. Don't worry, we'll finish the story later. Exodus chapter 3. God's people find themselves in a similar situation. As we've talked about last week, God's people are in bondage in Egypt. They have been in slavery for hundreds of years. Generations have grown up never knowing what it means to be free. They are in bondage. And throughout the Bible, this bondage is used to equate what we are in to sin. All of us have or are in bondage to sin without the grace of Jesus Christ. Notice I said have or are. Are you with me? There but for the grace of God, every one of us are generationally born in bondage to sin. Notice Genesis chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 2, are you there? Notice what he says. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So the Lord saw that he turned aside and God called Moses, Moses. Now, we're focusing on verse 7. So if you would, just slip down to verse 7. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and read those next four words with me, have heard their cry. God not only saw, but he also, he what? Does God hear the cries of his children? I praise God he hears our cries. I don't care what it is you are struggling with this morning. The great God of the universe hears your cries. It doesn't matter if it's a small, weak, pitiful cry coming from someone who feels completely destroyed by the experience they're in, or if it's a loud, powerful, weeping cry up at the heavens during the night saying, God, I'm broken and I need you. Please save me. Whatever it is, God hears the cries of his people. God does not walk away from those cries. He listens to them. He hears them. He's attentive to the cry of His people. No matter how enslaved or dejected you may feel this morning, God hears your cry. Christ, speaking of the care for his people, take your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. I want you to notice how much God promises to hear the cry of his people. You know, as we're talking about this, I think one of the reasons why we wonder that we haven't gotten victory over the areas we're struggling in is a lack of appreciation for the fact that Jesus really hears every prayer that's offered to him. Matthew chapter 10, are you there? And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather for him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? You've seen the sparrow outside or the bats that sometimes at night when you aren't here fly through this sanctuary? I think some of you old timers may have actually seen it during a service. I heard from Elder Ringstaff, but that's a whole other story. (laughs) We laugh. We think they aren't that important. We walk by the dead animals sometimes or the deer that's been hit on the side of the road or, or whatever it is. And yet God takes notice of even his creatures that are not human beings when they suffer, God notices. And then I want you to notice what Christ says in verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are not all, head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. Read the last part of verse 31 with me. Are you of more value than many sparrows? God hears the cry of His children. No matter where you are, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you are facing right now, God will hear your cry. I've sometimes heard someone say, you know, I hope that God answers my prayer. Church, oh church family, we are God's children. It's not I hope God will answer my prayer. It is I know God will answer my prayer. It may not be in the way I expect. It probably won't be. It may not be in the way that I want Him to, but He will answer the the prayer and answer according to His will in what we would choose if we could see His will. There is no just hope. There is a solid assurance that God hears the cries of His children. Do you feel that you are alone, that no one is hearing your cries? That when you cry yourself to to sleep at night or when you're driving to work in the morning or on your way home from work and the the echo in your mind and the, the, the yelling in your car for a God to hear and listen, I can tell you God hears those prayers. There's a friend of mine, he's now a uh, a minister in the up up north in Michigan, Jay Clough. He was driving to work. And he was fed up with the sins that he was facing in his life. And he was there in the car and he finally just blurted out, no one else was in the truck with him, he blurted out as loud as he could, God, if you can save me, please reach down and change my life. It didn't matter that he was in a truck driving down the freeway, God heard that prayer. God saved him. 
He was my personal ministries leader in my last district, and now he's a pastor up north. God hears the cries of his people. It didn't happen instantly. It was a long process, but God answered that prayer. You don't know today if you're going to be able to continue carrying the burden that you've borne for so many years. But take heart, my brothers and sisters. James chapter 5 and verse 4, the promise comes down today. The Lord of Sabaoth will hear the cry of His people. I've always been amazed at how mothers can hear the, the unique cry of their child, no matter how many kids are around. And God's ears is even better than a mother's. In the six plus billion people on this planet, your cry is more important to him than anyone else's. And yet the other person's cry is just as important to his heart. Somehow God in his infiniteness can make every single person as if you're the only person talking to him. I love this from Christ Object Lessons, page 174 powerful book. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to, but I want you to notice what Ellen White says on Christ Optic Lessons, page 174, paragraph 1. Let all who are afflicted or unjustly used cry to God. Never. What does she say? How often? Never is one repulsed who comes to him with a contrite heart. Not one sincere prayer is lost. Amid the anthems of the celestial choir, God hears the quiet cries of the weakest human being. We pour our heart's desires in our closets, we breathe our prayers, we walk by the way, and our words reach the throne of the monarch of the universe. They may be inaudible to any human ear, but they cannot die away into silence, nor that can they be lost through the activities of business that are going on, nothing, nothing can drown the soul's desire. It rises above the den of the streets, above the confusion of the multitude, to the heavenly courts. It is God to whom we are speaking, and our prayer is heard. Praise God. You who feel unworthy this morning, she continues on, fear not to commit your case to God. When he gave himself in Christ for the sin of the world, he undertook the case of every soul. And that includes you. God hears the cries of his people. As we return to Exodus chapter 3, God's people are crying out. And the great monarch of the universe hears the cry of his people and he responds by sending a messenger. And he comes down to Moses and he says, I've heard their cries and I'm going to do something in response to their cries. I'm going to send you to set my people free. And so God begins to move. But I find it interesting what God does. Go down to verse 19. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 19, God speaking, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. God tells Moses, I'm here to let, I've heard the cry of my people. I'm answering that cry and I'm going to send you to set them free. But the monarch is going to do everything he can to stop you from being set free. And church, just like in ancient Israel, so today, when God hears the cry of His people, there is a monarch that is going to do everything he can to stop the movement of God in setting His people free. Satan hears the cry of my heart asking for Jesus to change me. He hears the cry of my heart asking Jesus to take complete control of my life. And he, in trembling and fear, because at the name of Jesus, Satan has to flee. Praise God. And so in trembling and fear, Satan, hearing the heart cry of God's children, redoubles his angels to do everything he can to turn our eyes away from Jesus and look at the impossibilities of what's going on around us. 
He does all He can to re-pull us in to the things that God is setting us free from. And so, just like He does in our lives, so He did then. When He hears that God is going to set His people free, Satan is on the move to make sure that the Pharaoh on the throne will stand in opposition to God. But God says, don't worry about it. I'm going to set you free. And I want you to notice what God does. Go with me to Exodus chapter 5. God begins to move in a mighty way to set his people free. And what's interesting to me is why God does this. Because it seems really odd. I would have probably just nuked the Egyptians and brought the... Well, no, that wouldn't have been nice. But you understand what I'm saying, right? Send in an army. Put them all in constant. Do something. They've been... They're stopping this. Let the people out. But God does something very different. You see, God sends plagues on the Egyptians. Why? It's not just to punish the Egyptians. It's because God's people have at some level fallen in love with Egypt. Don't miss this. God sends the plagues not just to punish the Egyptians, but because God's people have at some level in their hearts fallen in love with Egypt. I came across a thought as I was studying for the message here that I found very interesting. Christ desires nothing so much as to redeem his heritage from the dominion of Satan. But before we are delivered from Satan's power without, we must be delivered from his power within. Before God can set his people externally free, internally they must come to the point where they hate sin. And for us to hate sin, we have to see how bad sin is. For the Israelites to hate slavery, they had to understand how bad slavery was. So notice what happens. We read this in our scripture reading earlier. Moses goes in before Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. Chapter 5, verse 1. Thus says the Lord of Israel, God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. I can see the, the scene in my mind. Pharaoh's there on his throne. Moses and Aaron just walk in to the throne room of God. They don't ask for permission. They don't ask for an audience. They just walk in because they're coming at the behest of Pharaoh's monarch, the king of the universe. And they walk in and they say, your boss has told you to let your his people go. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know who that is. No way. Not going to happen. In fact, I'm going to make their bondage even worse than it is now. Drop down with me if you would just a little bit to verse 6. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And they demanded the same amount. There is a principle that you will find throughout the Bible. Things always get the worst just before God delivers His people. Things always seem to be at their worst just before God delivers His people. We see that with the three Hebrews. They're in the fiery furnace. You can't get much worse than that. And that's when God delivers his people. You see this with David before Goliath. He's standing there. Here comes this giant about to take the head off of David. And that's when God delivered his people. All the way through the Bible, when things are the worst, that's when God is about to deliver you. And yet how often when things are getting worse, instead of lifting up our heads because our redemption is drawing nigh, in fear and trembling, we begin to wonder if we should be trusting God through the experience or not. We begin to wonder if God's really going to give us the victory, if God is really carrying us through or not. We begin to question, is God really in charge? We are no different than the Israelites. Notice they did the same thing down at the end of the verse. 
verse 20 of the chapter, I should say. Exodus chapter 5 and verse 20. Let me know when you're there. Because I want you to see this in your Bibles. They go to Pharaoh. The preceding verses, we're coming down to the point in verse 20. They go to Pharaoh in the preceding verses. And they say, Pharaoh, this isn't fair. And Pharaoh says, you're idle, you're idle. That's why you say you want to go serve the Lord. And so on their way back, they meet Moses and Aaron. And instead of doing what they should have said is, praise God, things are getting bad. We know God's about to deliver us. Verse 21, and they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us i.e., you've really blown it. Things have gotten worse, not better. You promised to deliver us, and look, we're now abhorred in their sight. But God, in His infinite mercy, was working through the circumstances that were happening because God needed His people internally to want to lead Egypt. You know what the problem was? The Israelites, if they had left Egypt without this, would have taken Egypt in their hearts. And the same is true with us. When God begins to move, to set us free from the things that we're struggling with, we've got to understand what it is that He needs to give us victory from. How bad it is. How evil it is. And so He lets us come into these experiences as we're wrestling in our hearts because we need to realize I can't change this until finally God takes control and the victory is won. I want to go back to that parking lot. I'm sitting there struggling, wrestling, and I finally realize that the problem is I haven't surrendered my entire heart to Jesus Christ. I've held back part of my emotions. I had given there, and praise God, I did. But the next step is now God was saying, Philip, do you trust me to replace your love of media so much that you'll walk away even though you want it? Do you trust me enough to replace this desire you have so much that you will walk away because you know these affections are no longer yours? They're Satan trying to pull you back into what I have given you victory from. And I was there in the parking lot and I remember breaking down and I stopped the car and I said, God, I am so sorry that I questioned the victory you've given me and have allowed myself to just drive around and around. The victory is here. My emotions aren't there. You know that. But you can fix my emotions. I trust you to do that by faith. I am going to drive out of this parking lot trusting you to take care of the desires I'm struggling with. And God gave me the victory. And I drove out of that parking lot without having gone in and bought. And there are many more battles and struggles that happen. Go with me to Romans or Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to notice how the Apostle Paul brings this out. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going down to verse 3 and 4. We'll probably jump up to verse 1 after that. For consider him who endured such hostility for sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Verse 4, read it aloud with me. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. This verse speaks to what I was wrestling with there. I was struggling with the decision, do I trust God more than my feelings? Do I believe God's Word more than my desires? You see, it wasn't discipline that got me through that parking lot. It was Jesus Christ. And He left before me there in His nail-princed hands and with tears in His eyes. He left before me as the cross was lifted up before me in the car. He left before me a choice. And He said, choose me or your addiction. Choose me or what you want. Choose me and have life. I can give you every desire of your heart. 
And church, that's the face that's left before each one of us. When we are in the midst of the trial, we have a choice to make Jesus or what we're struggling with. You see, the world needs to be crucified inside of my heart and in yours. And the great, omnipotent, loving, gracious, compassionate King of the universe, our Savior and our Lord, steps down through the palace of the universe down to my level. And He speaks to me and He says, Phil, if you will trust me, I will remove the world from your heart and make you into a new man in Jesus Christ. And like the, Egypt, like the Israelites, God will begin to take us through the process to where we hate sin and love Jesus with all our hearts. And that's what we need. I want to love Jesus with everything. How about you? I want this world out of my life. And God, by His grace, will do that. As we close, I want to remind you of the phrase we said earlier. Things always look worst just before God gives a victory. The smoker says, okay, God, I'm going to stop smoking. And those next three days are some of the worst you're going to go through. But God's giving the victory. The alcoholic says, I'm going to stop drinking. And as they, if they've been really, really drinking a lot, there is a withdrawal. And it feels like it's worse than it's in. But God is giving the victory. You who struggle with anger, you say, God, I give you my anger. And it seems like that week you face more things than you've ever faced in your life on anger. God's giving you the victory. You struggle with less lustful thoughts here this morning. You've struggled this last week and have fallen in the area of looking at inappropriate things. And today you're going to say, God, I'm giving this to you and I'm going to be victorious in Jesus Christ. And I can tell you this next week, you are going to feel like you're battling something like you had before. But God, if you trust in Him, will give you the victory. You see, it's not the struggle that tells whether we're gaining the victory. It is whether our eyes stay on Jesus and we trust Him through it. And so the appeal is simple. Every head bowed, every eye closed. What's the overmastering struggle of your life? I want to appeal to you to cry out to Jesus for victory. Because He'll give it. He will hear your cry. And then I want to appeal to you to then turn your eyes upon Jesus and, and by faith go forward in His strength. This week, you may face temptations like you've never faced before because Satan's going to try to stop you. But if you will keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and trust Him, He will carry you through. So first, put on the altar that area you've struggled. And then secondly, will you determine with me by God's grace, to trust Him through whatever temptations may come your way this week, that He will give you the victory.
that even if you're in that parking lot somewhere with whatever it is you've struggled with and tears are streaming down your cheek and you're saying, I don't understand God, but at that point you will surrender to Him and say, God, whatever this is, I will trust you even if it kills me to be victorious in Jesus Christ. You have given me the victory and I go forward by faith, ignite feelings in victory in Christ. If you want to commit with with me, because I need that help as much as you, to this week, trust in Jesus to be victorious in Him. Will you please stand? I'm going to invite our song leaders to come up here. The song we're about to sing is the first part of our prayer. I want you to notice the words, faith of the chorus. Faith is the victory. Notice the first verse, encamped along the hills. Whatever Satan may do, the victory is in Jesus Christ. Sing this as your prayer and we will close. Father in heaven, faith is the victory. As we face the challenges in our life, as we see what seems to be a moment when all is lost, faith looks through and sees that you are working out something beautiful, you're working out your victory in our lives, that you are transforming us into people that are sons and daughters of the King of the universe. Today, We want to trust in you. Father, you've seen it. Around this family sanctuary, each one of us have challenges and struggles that we're facing. Whether it is internal 
or external. Satan wants to destroy us, but Father, we are standing here on the promise that you who have begun a good work will carry it through to completion. We are standing here on the promise that when everything seems lost, if we turn to you, when you gain the victory on our behalf. We have surrendered to you what it is, and we trust you to carry it through for us. Now we lay our lives in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I could have my mic back on. Just before we dismiss, I have a special announcement. We are on the verge of seeing God do great things. Last week you heard me talk about how we're looking in a year of going to the Lansing Center. This week I met with them. They're very interested in what we're wanting to do. They're very excited about it. Albeit, I just found out yesterday that only eight of the 17 dates that we need are. And I was reminded last night that God will not move in the ways that He can unless His people earnestly seek Him in prayer. And so, Elder Fitzpatrick and myself, we spoke this, and we believe that we need to step forward in prayer. And so I am appealing to you to join us in as much as you can with what your health allows for a day of fasting and prayer on Wednesday. I'm asking you to, if you need to do a fruit fast, that's fine. If you can do a water fast, that's great. Whatever you're able to do with your health considerations, to make Wednesday a special day of prayer that God will open the door for us to reach this city for Him. And then I'm going to invite you to come to a special meeting Wednesday evening that's going to be focused specifically on doing evangelism to this community. You'll hear about it on the one call. Those of you who normally come, we're going to move it back half an hour. We're going to pray from 6.30 to 7.15, 7.30. And I'm going to ask you to please come. If you're watching on the live stream, to be here, please come. We want to shake the doors of heaven with mighty prayers, not mighty in us, but they go through the God who is mighty, who can move mountains before they're even seen, as was sung about earlier. And so I'm appealing to you as a church, appealing to you to join us in fasting and prayer on Wednesday. I'll have an email going off later today or tomorrow, I should probably say. Join us in fasting and prayer that God will open a way for us to move forward in reaching this city. Can we do that? Thank you. God bless. We'll now sing our dismissal song. Oh